All right, so today we have Marco Fazzi, and he will tell us about the hierarchy of RG flows in 6D 1.0 RB instantons. Take it away. So thank you very much, Julius. It's an honor to finally speak at the Quiver meetings and uh, even you know, to have the opportunity or the honor to give the last talk of the season, it's my understanding. So today I'm gonna be talking about um, the hierarchy of RG flows in 6D 1.0 RB instantons. Uh, this is based, let me see if this works. Yeah, this is based on a paper uh, that I published in August in collaboration with uh, Suven Dugiri, really a smart and strong postdoc out of Milano Bicocca. And time permitting, uh, I will be briefly touch, I will touch upon briefly uh, two work in progress that I'm uh, doing in collaboration with Suvendo and Simone on the one hand and uh, Suvendo and Paul on the other, uh, on the other hand. Um, some of the ideas that I will be using in this talk actually date back to papers that I uh, wrote in collaboration with a series of you know, people that I've written down here. But let me uh, stress from the outset that this uh, paper and talk actually exploits quite heavily uh, two uh, sets of results, two results, uh, one uh, by uh, Nopadol, Omori, Yuji, and Gabi, and the other by Santiago Ami and, uh, and Marcus. And you know, let me, I try to cite as many uh, people and papers as possible in the talk. I know that lots of people in the audience have worked on the subject. So my apologies if I have missed some of the uh, of the proper references. If you feel offended, of course, please feel free to uh, let me know by the, by the end of the talk. Okay, so the goal of the talk is essentially to explain what this uh, ice cream cone kind of picture uh, is. And as we will see, this is one example of, you know, hierarchy of our G flows between uh, these rather special, I would say, uh, 6D superconformal field theories uh, with one comma zero supersymmetry that go by the name of uh, Orbi instantons, that were dubbed Orbi instantons uh, a few years ago. <clears throat> so which one was the one you showed? Uh, K equal 14. But we'll, 14. Come, we'll come back to that in the right. very end, don't worry. So an important dynamical question in a dimension is, uh, we'd like to understand the structure of the RG flows between you know, conformal field theories. Conformal field theories are fixed points of the RG flow. So we'd like to understand uh, whether we can flow from one fixed point to the other. This is an important dynamical question in any dimension. Here and throughout, of course, I will only focus on uh, supersymmetric uh, CFTs. And you know, a, a quantitative handle on uh, these flows is um, monotonic functions, because famously we can characterize flows by finding functions that are mono monotonically, let's say, non-increasing uh, along these, uh, these flows. And in fact, in, even, in any even dimension, one such monotonic function is the so-called central charge of the uh, CFT, let me call it A, which can be used and has been used uh, to great success as a measure of the degrees of freedom of a CFT, which should reduce uh, along uh, a flow. In fact, if you put the CFT uh, on a curved background, you essentially couple it to some background metric, um, the uh, one point function of the stress energy tensor uh, is not zero anymore. So conformality is broken in some sense, and you can parameterize this breaking via uh, you know, certain tensors in the uh, Riemann curvature. And the coefficients are the so-called central charges. Now in 60, we have four central charges, A and three Cs, they satisfy some relation. And I will focus on this coefficient A um, as a measure of the degrees of freedom of the CFT. And famously, there is uh, something called A theorem, namely a statement that the A anomaly uh, of the CFT should actually reduce along the flow. So, because we're essentially integrating out uh, degrees of freedom. So the difference, quantitatively, the difference between this um, A anomaly computed at some UD fixed point minus the same A anomaly but computed at an IR fixed point should be positive along any allowed uh, RG flow. There is also an independent, logical independent uh, inequality that this A anomaly should satisfy, namely it has to be either zero or greater than zero. And in particular, the bound is saturated only if the theory has no local uh, degrees of freedom. So in some sense, it's just a positive uh, number for any uh, interesting, let's say, CFT. Okay, so given what I just said, um, a pressing question in any even dimension is, well, at least two pressing questions is, first of all, how do we prove such an A theorem. And famously, you know, this was proven uh, even without supersymmetry in two dimensions by Zawologikov. And in the four dimensional minimal supersymmetry case, so n equals one, uh, it was proven in a series of paper, papers by uh, Zor and, and Schwimmer. 
But even if it's proven, um, can we actually use um, the A theorem to fully map out the structure of the RG flows uh, between the theories? And actually here, I will take a slightly different perspective. And in fact, this is gonna be a quite a long detour. And rather than you know, trying to prove the A theorem directly uh, in 6D for the kind of flows we will be interested in, I will instead, which is the thing that happened, sorry. Um, I will instead construct all flows directly in D equals six for the super conformal field theories that I will introduce. And then I will just check a posteriori that the A theorem is satisfied, namely that for all flows that we can construct, delta A is positive. And I will use this you know, as a sort of a test to strengthen uh, the results that we will obtain. Okay, so D equal two is proven, D equal four with minimal SUSY, which contains all other supersymmetric cases was proven by uh, Zor and Schwimmer. So in some sense, D equals six is the last case uh, which is standing. Now, uh, CFTs in, in D equals six can actually be engineered uh, via string theory. And in fact, all known six dimensional CFTs are super conformable uh, field theories. So they're super symmetric. Here, I will focus on the minimal amount of supersymmetry, namely uh, one comma zero, just one Carroll supercharge. And in fact, two comma zero, just some uh, particular uh, subcase. Now the literature on the subject is, you know, immense. There's like a million paper on the on the topic, so we'll just reference, uh, you know, one essentially review, which is circa I think 2015, if I'm not mistaken. The so-called atomic uh, classification. Yes. Um, um, ju just while we are at it, uh, what about the odd dimensions? What's the standpoint on the odd dimensions with so, this? So there, I don't think, yeah, good question. So I don't think think there is any proof. First of all, as you know. In odd dimensions, you don't, you cannot use uh, central charges. What you can use is the sphere partition function, essentially. And for very large classes of um, 3D and 5D uh, CFTs, you can check in some sense. You can check that the uh, F theorem is, uh, is satisfied, but I don't think there's a proof. I think that's the status of the, uh, if you want, right now. So you can construct a monotonic function, it's the log of the sphere partition function of the CFT. And you can prove uh, that it decreases along all known flows, but you cannot essentially prove it, in, say, in, in the most general sense, in all dimensions, as far as I know. I see. OK. Thank you. OK, no problem. So um, in 1,0, in the 1,0 1, 1, supersymmetric case, we distinguish two types of supersymmetry preserving deformations that trigger flows uh, onto the moduli space, uh, the vacuum moduli space of these uh, theories. The first one is a so-called tensor branch flows, namely you give a BEV to the scalars in the tensor multiplets of, this, uh, of any 1,0 uh, theory. And in this specific case, RG flows and the A theorem are fully understood. And essentially the flows are rather simple to describe and the A theorem was actually proven in this paper by Cordova. Dumitrescu and Intrigator. Whereas the focus of this talk, it's gonna be uh, Higgs branch flows, which are harder and we'll see uh, why and how to characterize them. Okay, so what has been done so far for this second type um, of RG flows? So uh, Higgs branch flows, basically Higgsins of some symmetry. So to actually address or you know to state what's been done, let me take one step back and um, stress or remind that actually all 1,0 uh, theories come from two operations that have been dubbed in the literature in particular in this paper, fission and fusion operators, uh, sorry, operations of just two progenitor theories. So what you do is you can understand that any 1,0 uh, CFT can be obtained as a product of either of these two operations. So in some sense, it's enough to focus on the two progenitors that give rise upon cutting or gluing to any other uh, one comma zero. So the first type of progenitor is a conformal matter type, a certain conformal matter type theories that I will not introduce here. But roughly speaking, these are characterized by two nilpotent orbits of two flavor algebras, uh, let's say G left and G right, which um, are, if you want, located at the very, uh, at the leftmost and rightmost position of the quiver that describes the tensor branch um, of the CFD. Now in this specific case, and sorry, and the other type will be orbin centos, which is the focus of this uh, talk, this, the other progenitor. So in the first case, actually pretty much everything is understood. So Higgs branch flows 
can be understood. They're essentially triggered by so-called T-brain maps that one uh, turns on in the geometry. The hierarchy of flows has been very nicely uh, described in actually many, many papers. And essentially it takes the form of a Hasse diagram of the nilpotent orbits of the Lie algebra that you're using to Higgs. And also the uh, A theorem for Higgs branch flows in this case has been proven. And very roughly speaking, you know, this identity here is not precise, but what I mean is that you can prove that Delta A is positive for any of these uh, Higgs branch flows in the T-brain case, essentially by relating the A anomaly of the UV and IR fixed, point, fixed points to the dimension of the nilpotent orbits uh, that you're using. So you're transitioning from one nilpotent orbit to one below uh, in the Hasse diagram, and roughly speaking, the anomaly is related to the dimension of these guys. Okay, so in this, taking the difference again, roughly speaking, you can prove this difference is positive if the uh, orbits are ordered along the Hasse diagram as they are. So you can prove the, uh, the A theorem. Okay, now the situation for orbit symptoms, on the other hand, is actually not that, um, you know, it's not on par, let's say. And in fact, Higgs branches have been analyzed, but only rather recently. And I want to mention at least these three papers here. Um, the hierarchy of flows is not known, or at least I would like to stress it. You no, know, we fully mapped out, but before we only knew some examples, you know, some cases of uh, hierarchies, uh, in fact, had been analyzed, uh, starting with this paper by, by Jonathan and the collaborators, then Tom and, and a mathematician also, Frey also analyzed it, then Simone with Raffaele Moletti, I think, uh, gave a nice push toward the, you know, the, basically the right direction in characterizing fully these, uh, these flows. And the A theorem is not, uh, you know, has not been proven in this case. So in this talk, I would like to show how we were able to improve at least the first two points uh, of this program. So the first two question marks. Okay, so this is a brief outline of my talk. In the first part, I'm just gonna introduce essentially the terminology. So what we mean by 61,0 or being sentence at fixed N and K, or this N and K are two parameters uh, that in label, if you want, the CFTs. Then we're gonna move on and introduce the, uh, you know, the magnetic quiver, uh, which is the object that we will be using heavily to construct the flows. I will present how, to, uh, how one can obtain a hierarchy of RG flows. We're gonna, I'm gonna show some subtleties that only happen if you consider high enough K, where K is some parameter that I will introduce. And I will uh, you know, conclude by some, with an outlook and uh, a couple of conjectures. Hey, Marco, can I just ask a quick question? Sure. So uh, the conformal matter theories, you can also obtain by fission from the Orbi instantons, right? So in uh, fact, your correct. previous slide, you could have just said the Orbi instantons are the most wonderful. The point is that, the point is that if, it's my, if I remember uh, correctly, the paper by Jonathan, Alessandro, and Tom, most of the theories you get by uh, fission from Orbi instantons, modulo some outliers. Okay, so to get some very short quivers, uh, then you also need to consider some outliers and then fuse, and the outliers are conformal matter type in some sense. I it's see. true that indeed most of the theories uh, can be gotten just by uh, cutting essentially Orbi instantons. Right, but if you can construct the conformal matter theory by fissioning the Orbi instanton, then you can take the, the conformal matter that you obtained by fissioning and fuse it onto something else. Yes, that's something that, so maybe, okay, maybe this slide, this slide was slightly imprecise. What I mean is that it is true. Most of the theories, as you say, come from just Orbi instantons. And by the way, this just reinforces the fact that it's even all the, you know, all the more important to understand hierarchy of flows for Orbi instantons. I just wanted to say that, you know, for T-brains, that's what has been established. Mm -hmm. But in the fission and fusion thing, you also need to consider some outliers. Uh, now I don't remember exactly which kind of quivers are those, but I sort of remember that they're really short quivers that you need to consider and fuse with the fission products to obtain all the other theories. Okay, okay, cool. If I remember correctly. Yeah, okay, Good. that's great, thank you. Okay, so what are these orbit symptoms that we've been talking about uh, for the past 10 minutes? So you take a bunch of M5s, and you take them very close, not just to an orbifold point that I uh, you know, drew here in, in red, but also to a so-called M9 wall, which is in some sense half of the space time that you know, in the hojawa witten setup. So you have M theory on an interval and half of it, you take just half of it. And one of the boundaries is this M9 wall that in 
for example, in a duality with heterotic would uh, carry uh, the degree, the gauge degrees of freedom of any eight uh, Lie algebra. Oh, okay. Um, these theories also have um, an F theory description and I'm using, you know, standard notation of say the atomic paper. What I mean here is that on the left, we have a flavor E8 algebra and I will mean the Lie algebra of the flavor symmetry here. So in this talk, we're not gonna see anything that relates, you know, to the global structure of the flavor symmetry, um, zero form symmetry, nothing like that. On the right, we have another um, symmetry factor G that comes, uh, if you want, it's a group associated with the Mackay correspondence to the AD group of the orbifold. And on top of these curves, so we have a single minus one curve, then we have a bunch of minus two curves. And these are decorated by um, a Lie algebra G, which is AD type. And just for reference, remember that the rank N E string would be another slightly simpler one comma zero theory where you have a single E8 uh, factor on the left and then you have a bunch of curves, but these are undecorated. Okay, so the difference with, with the E string is that in the Orbi instanton case, the, uh, you have a fiber type, you have a fiber over these curves uh, of you know, this AD uh, type. Okay, so the torus is shrinking. Um, so let's focus for simplicity as we've done in the paper on type A. So the orbit field is just, you know, C2 mod ZK, the algebra is SUK uh, or SLK if you wanna be precise and the group is just uh, SUK. Now the fully blown up F theory configuration. So the full tensor branch of this theory looks like so. And you see that here on the left, I'm actually writing E8. However, this actually implicitly assumes that as I just said, the configuration uh, in F theory say that comes from M theory close to the M9 wall preserves the full E8 uh, gauge symmetry that is associated with the wall. So in other words, I've chosen a so-called flat E8 connection at the spatial infinity S3 that wraps, that surrounds, if you want, the orbital point. But more generally, I must have, you know, you must specify, given that this theory here under duality with the heterotic is the theory of n small e8 instantons, you, on top of specifying the instanton number k, which in the, say, m theory setup is just the order of the orbital, c2 mod ck, you also have to specify a boundary condition at infinity. And this is nicely encoded in a choice of uh, homomorphism, if you want a representation of ZK inside uh, E8. And luckily for us, this was were actually classified uh, in a book by Katz from the 80s. And there's a very simple algorithm to actually uh, fully spell out the, the, all of your choices of homomorphisms or embeddings, if you want, of ZK inside E8. And it works like so. So you take not quite the E8 thinking, but rather the affine, Yay, Dinkin. And you, say, you can see here that I've extended Dinkin by adding this uh, node, uh, say, Coxeter level one. And um, the choice of homomorphism is specified in a specific partition of K, the order of the orbital, not by using you know, random integers, but rather using the Coxeter labels of the affinite. So you can see here, I'm using the integers one through six, and then four prime, three prime, and two prime. So just another copy of say four, three, and two. This, I believe, um, was dubbed Katz label in this paper here. Um, but you know, in mathematics, uh, Paul instructs me that this is a rather known as you know a choice of Katz coordinates or a Katz diagram. And basically, what you do is you just write k as you know this sort of partition where the exponents here just mean the multiplicities of the Coxeter label. So I'm using one through six and then another copy of four, two, and three, okay? And the other fun part of the game is that actually, uh, once you specified your um, you know, flat connection at infinity, your homomorphism of ZK into E8, uh, you can also quite easily uh, obtain the preserved flavor symmetry. Um, and to do that, you just need to delete the nodes that appear in the chosen partition of K. So let's see an example of that. For example, I could write rather trivially K as, you know, K times one. And this basically means that I'm choosing N one equal K times the extending node of the affine E8. So what I'm left with is just the non-affine E8. And this means that your uh, choice of homomorphism, your boundary condition at infinity preserves the full E8. By the same token, K um, partition as two and then k minus one times one would preserve not the full e8, but rather e7 
plus a U1, and so on. Now the game is really easy to play, of course. So we need to understand that the left flavor algebra of any Orbi instanton, let's say in the F theory description, generically is a regular maximal, it's a subalgebra V8. But the point is that this subalgebra can only be of type E, D up to eight, so S of 16 at most, or A up to eight, so SU9 at most. And we will see remnants if you want, or we will see that this fact is rather well represented in the hierarchy of RG flows that we will construct. And also in the end of the talk, I will come back to this point uh, with you know, a conjecture that relates to this. Let me just point out, um, you know, as a side comment, even though this plays quite an important role in the paper, so if you're interested, you can go read the, the specific section about you once, that whenever you have a single part, uh, if you want, you are only using a single Coxeter label in the CATS label, then the, uh, you will not have any one factor in the preserved algebra. Where, whereas if you use more than one Coxeter label, as in, you know, two and one, for example, in this example here, you will immediately see the appearance of uh, generically, you know, one you want, but even more, perhaps. And you have to be careful because, as we've discussed in a paper uh, with Jonathan, Fabio, Tom, and uh, and Hal, um, it's actually uh, it's not quite the case that all you ones that you see, uh, you know, that are part of the flavor symmetry are actually there. You have to be careful about the ABG anomalies and and stuff like that. But again, this is just a side comment. I will not uh, discuss about it anymore. Okay, so another important fact uh, that was stressed in this in the action in the atomic classification paper is that on the F theory side, you have one configuration per homomorphism in M theory. So your choices of uh, embedding of ZK into E8 are uh, completely are non-degenerate in some sense on the F theory uh, side. So by using this fact and using an algorithm that was introduced in this other paper by Nopadol, Gabi, Yuji, and Omori. Uh, that constructs the uh, full tensor branch of any F theory configuration associated with any choice of Katz label on the M theory side, our goal is to study Higgs branch flows at the origin of the tensor branch. So for CFTs, using the F theory description, okay? So it's obvious that, you know, in rank eight, the only, the only thing that I can consider or can have is Katz label one to the K. And as we've seen, that preserves the fully eight. However, if I, you know, now consider say rank seven plus one in this way of splitting eight, I uh, immediately see that I have at least two options. In fact, these are the only two options that I have. I could either consider two and then one to the K minus one or two prime and then one to the K minus one. And these two cats labels actually uh, preserve two different um, flavor algebras on the left. And the, and this, <coughs> the situation, yes? Can I ask, sorry, a stupid question. Why can't you have, if K is even, you could take two to the power K over two? And then it would be rank eight. Um, you're right. Uh, let me think about it. Uh, yes, you could do that as well. The point is that this doesn't preserve the eight because we're sure. Sure. But it yeah, is. sure, you can do that. Sorry, I was just uh, implicitly assuming that KB uh, odd. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this is meant to essentially imply that, you know, as you go down in rank in some sense, oh, sorry, this way. Uh, your the number of options that you can consider grows. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, and then you ask yourself, okay, good. Uh, I can see that I have this structure. For example, at rank six plus two, I could consider you know a cat's label three, two, one with some powers, or for example, three and only one with some powers, and these preserve different algebras. So now you ask, okay, what is the structure of the flows, if any, that you know connect these different uh, theories? Okay, so okay, you're imposing the starting point, the rank eight, you're, you're fixing it to be E8. If you want, yeah, we're imposing the starting point. The point is that for any K, you will always have the cats label one to the K that preserves the fully eight. And essentially by, if you want direct inspection, we have uh, seen, and this was rather surprising to me at first, that the theory that preserves the fully eight is always at the bottom, bottom of your hierarchies for any choice of K. And we we uh, you know uh, scanned up to some very reason, sorry, to some reasonably high values of k. Mm -hmm. So if you want phenomenological observation, the bottom cuts label of in any in any hierarchy is always the the one that preserves c eight. But but that's a choice, isn't it? So th this thing uh, is all this complicated things that you could also choose to start from the theory with the e eight. And then you have a moment map of the EA and you can Higgs it with the, I think with the we will, label and uh, get. 
you're right. So what you're asking is related more to the what I'm gonna uh, discuss at the very end. Perhaps you have in mind the hierarchies that Simone and Raffaele have and Moletti have constructed, or you can actually flow from E8 to say some K equals six, for example, E7 plus one. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. But yes. However, to do that, you're changing n, the parameter, the number of m pipes. Agreed. You yeah. do small instant on transitions. Exactly. So here, for you know, uh, exposition purposes, if you want, I've chosen, and I'm gonna state it actually uh, explicitly in a second. I'm chosen. I've chosen not to change n. Mm -hmm. Okay. So n is fixed. Okay. So you can all the hierarchies yeah. that yeah. I'm gonna show. So then, if you fix n, and sorry, this wasn't perhaps very, uh, you know illuminating, but this writing n comma k was there to mean fix n and k, I keeps going off, fix n and k, and then you have these choices of uh, cats labels, but you're absolutely right. If you allow n to change, then as you say, you can flow essentially from e a to e7 plus one and so on. Mm -hmm. It's just that the structure of the hierarchy becomes super complicated, even yes. just to write down, but we'll see what it means. Perhaps we have a conjecture about it at the very mm -hmm. end. Great, thanks. So thanks for the question. The reason yes. the reason to keep n fixed is for simplicity. Correct. Okay. Good. For simplicity. Exactly. But as I said, since you guys keep asking, uh, this complicated is enough. Yeah. Of, you're right. This <laughs> is an important point. I think the physics is related to the fact that indeed you can perform and you should perform instant on transitions. And so there must be some other mathematical object, and we know we have a wild conjecture for what that is, uh, that includes if you slice it in in some way you see the hierarchy at uh, flows at fixed n. And if you slice it in some other way, you see the hierarchy uh, where you also allow n to change at fixed k. At least k you have to fix. Okay. Jumping like 20 slides ahead. <laughs> okay. So the question now I think should be clear. We want to understand the structure of these flows, okay? Between these SCFTs labeled by CATS labels. Let me take a slight detour and you know, remind the audience of what happens in the case of conformal matter. As, um, as I was saying at the beginning, here actually the structure of the, of the flows, the hierarchy of the flows is rather well understood. And what happens here is that the hierarchy of Higgs branch RG flows in the case of conformal matter mimics very close, in fact, it's exactly the same, the Hasse diagram of nilpotent orbits of say, the left level algebra uh, script G, okay? Let me draw a very stupid example. This is not a conformal matter theory, it doesn't matter for these purposes, but you know, consider the, say the collision of two A3 singularities in a theory in this language. You have part of the quiver, uh, you know, the tensor branch description of the 61 comma zero I've written down there. So you start on the left with an SU4 algebra, then you would have, for example, some uh, number of uh, gauge SU4 nodes and then tensor multiplets and so on. And the point is that you can start Higgs in this SU4, you know, in this uh, fashion here, and you can understand this Higgs in, in a very nice way, for example, associating Yang tableau to the uh, ending pattern of the six brains, which will be the horizontal lines here on the eight, um, you know, in, in, in a rather natural way. And you can easily associate that to the different integer partitions of number four, in this case, I've chosen the, you know, the algebra is SU4. You can associate that very easily with the uh, integer partitions of, of four, just because you know you take the differences between the ranks of the gauge groups, and for example, four minus zero is four, four minus four is zero, so the first quiver is associated to partition four, but then three minus zero is three, four minus three is one, and the second uh, you know tensor branch, it's the second quiver from the top is associated to partition three comma one, and so on and so forth. Okay. By doing so, you realize that the structure of the RG flows that you can construct, say via uh, brain moves essentially by sliding off to infinity trap segments of the sixes meaning exactly the structure of the Hasse diagram nilpotent orbits of the Lie algebra. And this can be repeated for all classical Lie algebras, but also rather impressively for uh, exceptional uh, Lie algebras. Okay. Hi, it's me. I have a question though. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the flavor group, right? It's it's really U4, not SU4, right? In this case, it, because the it groups are SU4. Uh, the notebook orbits are a different story, I think, right? When you have UN and not SUN. So I see that the brainy picture it cl clearly matches well with the, the young diagrams, but I'm trying to understand what. Uh, so it's. Because I mean, this, this you could have had this story in three dimensions where the gauge nodes would have been U4, U4, and so on. And then the flavor group would have been SU4. 
like a Gayato witness system, then, then this would make sense physically. Yes and no. I mean, the point is that you want, um, so you have to be careful whether the U1 symmetries um, of the global, the, the, you know, the U1 components of the global symmetries actually uh, play a role in the, if you want, in the, in the CFT. So you have to be careful which are genuine global symmetries and which are not because of uh, ABJ anomalies, essentially. Well, they, they act as so in particular, you have to remove a certain combination of you once. And in this very simple setup, that's equivalent to saying, if you want to stating that the symmetry on the, that rotates the brains is SU, roughly, the V8 brains is SU, roughly speaking. So you're saying the global U1 is an yeah. or something? There is a combination that, is, there is only one combination that is free of ABJ anomalies. That's something that we discussed with Fabi, Jonathan, uh, Tom. Okay. And how, yeah. Okay, thanks. In any case, so the, the order, if you sorry, the, the hierarchy here of, of flows um, mimics the order on the partitions, and that is also very well known to mimic the, uh, the order between the orbits seen as varieties, the so called closure ordering, if you want to use the language of, say, Collingwood and McGovern. Okay, so this was just a reminder. Oops, oh, sometimes it stops working. Okay, so the question, the natural question that we want to ask is question one, is there a similar hierarchy for urban instantons? And you know, why am I asking that question? Essentially, it's because of what Craig was also asking. They're important as progenitors, uh, given the fusion operation um, in the fusion and fusion paper, they're in, very important as progenitors of any or most one comma zero theories. And question number two is um, if so, so if there is a hierarchy, if there is a structure, how do we find it? And does it mimic any? partially ordered object in, in mathematics, as in the case of you know, conformal matter theories. And the idea here is to use a very, a very powerful object that was introduced, I think in the first paper is uh, Santiago Amin and Marcus, but again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is to use something called 3D magnetic quivers instead of the tensor branch descriptions of the uh, CFTs, namely the so-called 60 electric uh, quivers. Okay, so the implementation is very simple. You take the 60 tensor branch, the electric quiver that describes uh, the low energy dynamics of the CFT on the tensor branch. You do 3D dualities along directions which are spanned by all uh, brains, and then you apply mirror symmetry. Okay, so here on the left, I'm drawing the you know typical uh, setup with the six and S fives and the eight brains that would engineer some very simple 60 one comma zero theory. You do 3D dualities and you end up with a simple hanani witten setup where the electric object, so the light, the massless BPS degrees of freedom can be read off by stretching F1 uh, strings between these brains. But if I apply now S duality, so mirror symmetry of 3DN equals four, now I discover that the magnetic, the light degrees of freedom of the magnetic object, or if you want the magnetic object is a D1 brain, okay? It's a dual to the F1 under S duality. And if I take 3T dualities back, I discover that the object that I have to you know, consider to read off the magnetic version in some sense of the uh, 6D electric quiver are D4 brains that can be stretched between an S5 and D6 and an S5 and an S and an S5 again. So the light degrees of freedom, the BPS massless states, if you want, are encoded in a 3D N equals four quiver that is being dubbed magnetic quiver. And the important property that was shown in a series of papers by Amin collaborators is that the Coulomb branch of this three magnetic quiver actually captures, essentially because of S duality or mirror symmetry, if you want, captures the Higgs branch of the 60 electric quiver. And rather importantly, we have an extra advantage in that the magnetic quiver associated with the 60 electric one captures the Higgs branch, not just of the gauge theory on the tensor branch, but also of the CFT at the infinite couple. So at the origin of the tensor branch, I can still use the magnetic quiver to describe the Higgs branch. Uh, of the CFD. This is the property that is very important for our purposes. So the rules uh, to construct these magnetic quivers in the case of um, you know, 60 1 comma 0 theories that are engineered same type 2a, for example, which will be the dimensional reduction of M theory down to 10d uh, have been summarized in this paper. And for Orbins, and I will not go through the, you know, the construction of these magnetic quivers, but what I want to stress is that for Orbins and Tons, these magnetic quivers uh, take a rather peculiar uh, form. So what I'm showing here is that, you know, some examples, if you take, say, K equals six, okay, 
So take uh, cats label six and then take cats label uh, five comma one. So these preserve two different algebras that I've written down there coming from the you know, two different choices of homomorphisms of Z6 into E8. But the point is that for both of these um, examples, and in fact, for all of them, the magnetic quiver of the Orbin sentence that, were, that was constructed by, by Ami, Santiago, and Marcus always takes this form. So you have a ramp up to basically uh, of unitary groups. So the notation here means, uh, you know, like a little dash is a hypermultiplet and a number is the rank of a unitary gauge group. Uh, so you first have a ramp up to UK, in this case, U6, and then you have any eight dinking tail that has to do essentially with the fact that we started uh, in M theory with an, e9, uh, with an M9 wall uh, carrying an E8 algebra. Okay, another way of understanding, um, uh, sorry, uh, okay, we can also, yeah, let me skip this. This is not really important, uh, that's okay. All right, so this here I've just you know shown a couple of examples of these um, magnetic quivers for orbit instructors. Okay, so now we're basically ready to construct the flows. Finally, we all the you know ingredients have been set up. So the first thing that we do is construct magnetic quivers for all cats labels, SFTs, and again let me stress at fix n and k. Okay, so this is not in the direction that Craig was asking about before. For exposition purposes, let's say for ease of exposition, we fix, at least in this part of the talk, uh, K obviously, but also N. Then we start subtracting the magnetic quivers. Quick, quick question. Yes. Uh, these are just now the cuts embeddings. So for each embedding, you get a magnetic quiver, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, just I'm with you. Exactly. Then we use an operation that was introduced by Anne Santiago, which, co which is called um, quiver subtraction. And if the subtraction is allowed, we uh, propose that a flow exists between two uh, SCFTs. And let me skip that for a second. And finally, we check essentially that the proposed flow obtained the equivalent subtraction uh, is compatible with the A theorem. So as I said at the very beginning, instead of you know, trying to prove directly the A theorem, we first construct uh, flows in some way. For example, here we're using magnetic quivers to do that. And then we check compatibility with the A theorem by computing the anomaly of all you know, SFTs for any given cuts label. There's a very easy, uh, rather easy way of computing the anomaly. And then we check that for each uh, proposed flow, the uh, A theorem is satisfied, namely delta A is strictly positive. Okay. So by the way, just a quick, you know, again, I don't want to spend too much time on the techniques here, but basically what is quiver subtraction? You stack on top of each other two magnetic quivers and you subtract literally the gauge, the ranks of the gauge groups. And if you get, you know, no negative number in the subtraction, basically the subtraction is allowed modulo some operation that is called rebalancing. But again, these are technical remarks. I will not uh, get into, into that. So first of all, you construct the magnetic quivers, use, use some operation that was introduced in the literature called magnetic quiver, uh, subtraction of magnetic quivers. If the subtraction is allowed, we propose that a flow exists and we check compatibility with the A theorem to give strength to the proposal assumption. So um, when when we do quiver subtraction, then typically, let's say you have some theory, you have magnetic quiver for the theory, then the theory that we can flow to on the Higgs branch is a quiver that we subtract from our original quiver. Has, a, has as a magnetic quiver, is something that we can subtract from the original quiver. Is this, do you, is this what you say? Uh, correct. Okay. So you subtract okay. the one you would flow to from the original. That's okay. Yes. That's okay. Good. Perfect. Yeah, exactly okay. what we do. Yes. You can phrase it this way. Yeah. So by doing that, for example, we get this. So this is one example that does not look yet as the you know ice cream uh, ice cream cone uh, picture that I had at the very beginning. But uh, the minute I increase k, uh, it's gonna start looking like that. But this is one example of hierarchy of x branch flows that we uh, that we got. Okay, so you will see, for example, that in this HASA diagram, because this is a partially ordered set of nodes, we have nodes which are which represent cats labels that are written down here, but then also edges, and each edge represents an allowed uh, flow, again compatibly with the A theorem, namely delta is positive for each of these arrows here. So you will notice that this is not the HASA diagram of the impotent orbits of any the algebra. So we start. Even at this, you know, for this rather simple example of k equals six, you immediately realize 
that what we uh, saw for uh, conformal matter theories, namely that the structure of the hierarchy of energy flows uh, mimics closely the Hasse diagram of nilpotent orbits of the Lie algebra tetrahexane, is not uh, a feature of Orbian Santos. However, um, some you know, similarity is present in the sense that, for example, if you focus on these red dots here, you will notice if you stare at it uh, you know, for five minutes that this is the Hasse diagram of nilpotent orbits of SU6. So this means that you can indeed embed um, some um, Hasse diagrams of certain SU Lie algebras. And the reason is actually clear from the type 2a picture. I will explain that in a second. And I'm gonna I'm using here the convention. So the red dash, the dashed lines just means you know basically uh transitions if you want between the important orbits of SU6 or flows. There's a question in the chat, perhaps, or flows um that you would do uh in a normal SU6, SU6 conformal matter. Okay. So why is this the case? Well, the point is that for this specific flows here, we have a very nice type 2a picture to explain what is happening. So if you consider, again, let me focus on this simple example of cats label six flowing to cats label five one via something that we called a five, little a five. Um, this cats label preserves SU6, SU3, SU2, and five one preserves SU5, SU4, U1. And now you can, if you want to reduce the M theory picture, down to type 2a that's why i had this uh figure in the previous slide but what happens is that for example the type 2a setup that engineers the same sft would be uh the one here at the, at the top this one here where the dash line represents an 8 minus plane vertical lines represent the eights for example we have two here six years and horizontal lines represent the sixes and the dots represent the s5s okay so this is the uh type 2a setup associated with this the reduction of this cuts label and this associated with the reduction of this 5-1 cuts level. Now I can uh, perform very simple Hanna and Witten moves and get from this picture here to this picture here. And by using you know, standard combinatorics, I can associate the ending pattern of these D6 brains onto the D8 brains to this young tableau. And likewise, I can do it here. And now we can, it's rather easy to understand what's happening. You're basically sliding off to infinity this trap segment of D6 brains or said differently, you're taking this box and bringing it down by one. And so, and this is exactly what's been, uh, oh, there's a, there's a typo here. This should be Kraft and Procesi, not Proesi, but whatever. So um, this is exactly what's been described, say, in physics, you know, as one, a certain flow of, say, an SU6, SU6 conformal, again, it's not conformal matter, but let me use the notation, uh, conformal matter theory. So you're just giving a VEV, to um, you're activating an important, sorry, you're activating a VEV for the moment map of this SU6. Um, and on the mathematics side, and this is what the notation A5 uh, means, and on the mathematics side, you're doing what AMI has dubbed kraft Procesi uh, transition. So you're somehow degenerating the singularity type of, the, of a certain important orbit to another singularity type of an important orbit that lies below it in the uh, ordered Hasse diagram, okay? And this has been dubbed A5 kraft Procesi transition. That's why the um, the labels, sorry, the edges here are, are labeled with these uh, letters. And indeed, again, edges are labeled and they're labeled by these three types, uh, big A, little a, and little d, this should be a little i. And also E, but E will only appear later on when I allow uh, N to change, uh, basically because of small instant transitions. So whenever you see one of these labels in the uh, Hasse diagram of flows, it means that the, the product, if you want, of the quiver subtraction is something like that. Okay, so it's a quiver of this shape of dinking type. So this is a 3D and equals for uh, quiver with these ranks. That is the product of the subtraction between, uh, say, uh, six and five one. Okay, and this is very well known from the, uh, say, the theory of nilpotent orbits, or again, Higgs flows between conformal matter theories. And in fact, the generation of the singularities uh, that the uh, nilpotent orbits uh, are, because nilpotent orbits are in general singular varieties, has been studied for classical Lie algebras by Kraft and Procesi in the 80s, and then Paul and collaborators have extended 
their work also to the case of exceptional uh, algebras. And you know, there is a massive amount of literature, mostly due to Ami, Julius, Antoine, Marcus, Jean Gao, and again, for uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry if I'm uh, forgetting about somebody, but there's a massive amount of you know, there's a huge body of work relating essentially 3D and equals for moduli spaces and the theory of nilpotent orbits in classical or exceptional uh, Lie algebras. So given what we just said, given what we found, even in the simple k equals six uh, case, um, the question is now in the Hasse of homomorphisms. So, or said differently, in the hierarchy of Higgs branch flows for orbit instantons, why are we seeing again, Kath, Procesi kind of transitions appearing? So are we degenerating the singularities of some mathematical object that you know, is partially ordered? So this is a question that we will try to answer with a conjecture at the very end of the talk. And here comes what I showed at the very beginning. So if you now crank up uh, K, you will see that uh, this structure, uh, this kind of structure starts appearing. This is, this, so this shape, if you want, is rather generic for high enough K. And for example, at the very beginning, I flashed the K equals 14 Ks. So if before in this picture here, we had just you know red and uh, and green and and then the edges we are color blue. I will explain. So red, I already explained what it means. Green, I will explain in a second what it means. But if you start cranking up K, you see that these graphs are actually populated by many other colors. So what is the meaning uh, of these colors? Uh, Julius, is there a way to uh, make the you know the top bar go away because it's kind of okay. It, now it's gone. No, uh, it's, it's Paul that was like, okay, good. <laughs> so Paul was replying to somebody's question, I guess. Um, um, so the colors that you see here, so these uh, red, blue, and magenta represent now three different ways of embedding the full SU8 or SL8 nilpotent orbits Hasse diagram. And we have a good reason, you know, by using the type 2 reductions of the various CATS labels that you see here to um, explain the appearance of these um, SU8 nilpotent orbits Hasse diagrams. Essentially, you're, you take the, you know, the type 2a description of this uh, top node, and what you do, you start sliding off the eights in the natural way that you would expect if you want to reproduce the Hasse diagram of SU8. And you can, starting with three different SFTs and their type 2a reductions, you can play this game, okay? So, as you increase K, you will have more and more ways of embedding, say, SU8, uh, the hassle of SU8 in this specific case. But what about the other colors? Okay, do these represent embeddings of uh, some other Hasse diagram? Um, the answer is no, and they represent something else. So it's well known that sometimes um, that 60 theories can be characterized by theta angles. And for example, it was shown in this paper by Nopad, Gabi, Eugenio Mori, that um, if you consider K equals 12 plus eight, these two cats labels for any choice of K will actually be characterized by the same electric quiver, okay? Both preserve SU8 plus U1. So there's some degeneracy in some sense between these two SFTs. And it, it was proposed in that paper that the difference between these two gauge theories is actually captured, so this is, with the electric quiver is actually captured by the theta angle of the 60 gauge theory. There's a couple of ways of understanding that. Um, a more mathematical one is, if you want, is that because the pi five of this USP is Z2, you have a Z2 value number, let me call it theta, and this represents, and let me call this theory theta equals zero and this theta equals pi. This essentially captures the two way of embeddings, this SU12 uh, plus eight into the flavor SO, uh, for L plus 16 of the first USP algebra, okay, with, which, which has 12 plus eight fundamentals from the, from the right. Another way of saying that is that if you compute the magnetic quivers of these two cats labels, you will see that they differ, but very subtly. So, and in fact, it was shown by Yami, Santiago and Marcus that the only difference between the two magnetic quivers is an exchange between these G7 and G8 uh, numbers, which are just functions of basically the parts in the cats labels. Okay, so the, the bottom line is that you have at least an instance for this specific A that was found by Nopi and friends where two different cuts labels 
In fact, that one parameter family of those have the same electric quiver. But we were actually able to extend this. Yes, go ahead, Craig. Uh, sorry, why do you call this an automorphism? Because it's, it's not an automorphism. That's why it's in quotation oh, okay, marks. Okay. <laughs> so, well, actually, let me be more precise. If you perform n small instant term transitions, there is a phase, if you want, of this magnetic quiver that looks like a very long tail. And mm -hmm. then basically, uh, you know, Mm. A, a two, sorry, a very long uh, ramp plus a tail, a bifurcated tail that ends in n plus g8 and then n plus g7 or g8 and g7. And in that case, it's truly a z2 automorphism of the magnetic quiver in that presentation. So, so it's like it's an automorphism of the finite coupling magnetic quiver. And then there are like two exactly. ways to go to infinite coupling. That's if you want, you can call it that. Yes, but in this presentation, it's true that it's not as it's not an outer automorphism. That's why it's in quotation marks. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, just swap G seven and G eight. Okay, by basically by staring at our you know graphs for high k, we actually realized that we could generalize that, and we found in fact infinite families which are parameterized by three integers. I don't want to bother you you know with the with the details, but basically you just enlarge a little bit the cat's labels by not just including the prime integers, so for prime, three prime and two prime, but also you include parts, uh, these curly, these PIs in curly brackets, they're essentially the parts of a certain partitions of some number k minus k zero, whatever that means, that only uses one through six. And if you do that, you will find that many SCFTs, you know, many cuts labels in the, in the hierarchy are actually distinguished in the above sense by the theta angle. And these are the different colors that you've seen here. So if we go back one step here, here, for example, this uh, cyan and orange, whatever, and the olive green lines, and then again, the brown, and I think, uh, yes, the two brown here are essentially as if cats labels that in the sense that I just explained are distinguished by theta angle on the tensor branch. And again, this is a generic feature. The minute you go up uh, in K, you will start seeing this. The reason these structures were not found if you want in the papers that describe some of the flaws, for example, Simone has one, uh, Tom's, is that um, in those papers that were able to construct hierarchies for low K and these features are not there for low K. That's a problem. Or if you want the feature of high K. Sorry, can we, uh, can, can you go back to the big picture again? Mm -hmm. Just wondering, okay, so the green, I uh, know the red, the blue and the magenta. Those are, are uh, like SU8 uh, or SL8 open yes. orbit diagrams. Okay. Then you have two yeah. brown, which are parallel to each other. Can you see them uh -huh. here? Can, yeah. Oh, oh, amazing. Oh. I can actually okay. zoom. So brown and brown. So these are, again, uh, oh, wow. feet angle and feet angle, zero yeah. and pi, zero and pi. Okay. Uh -huh. Or again, zero and pi, 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 and so on and so forth. And here we, we used two different colors to distinguish them because they were too close to each other. But again, theta equals zero, theta equals pi, and so on and so forth. And so we have this structure of parallel flows where, you know, SCFTs flow into each other, but in some sense, they don't, the flows don't cross. Uh, you know, they flow into theories, which are, again, have the same electric quiver and they're, they're just distinguished by theta angle. That's easy. And the, the CN and the orange are respectively both uh, SL5. Uh, SL5? Or... Uh, SL6, SL6, I guess. Uh, what do you mean? These are not important Hasse's. If you, take, if you take the Hasse diagram, it looks like um, the SL6 uh, Hasse diagram, no? Uh, no, I don't think. If you just, if you just take the CN and the Hasse diagram, it looks like the SL6. Um, I, see. I see what you mean. Ah. And then, so they're all A type, okay. so, A type so uh, Newport orbit Hasse diagrams. So this and may you be get two copies. This may be in the sense that, let me see though, there's a four prime, it may be. I mean, if you then write down, I mean, one way of seeing that is that you would construct the type to a reduction of these guys. And perhaps you can, again, start the, playing with this uh, D8 peeling off game where you can indeed construct the SU, uh, SL6 Hasse. I have not paid attention to this example. Okay. okay. Maybe Subend remembers, I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, so you don't have a statement that it's always an it SL with an orbit. No. Uh, no. New tone has a diagram, and then you get two topics. Okay. No. All right. Thank you. I mean, maybe it's true. It's just that I don't have this statement at the moment, so I don't want to make it. But yeah. Sure. Thank it, you. It, is there? 
is there a statement that the as long as you preserve the multiplicities of the primed uh, things, then the other stuff will form itself into a, a nilpotent Hasse diagram. Because that looks like what's happening here. And that sounds like a generic picture, because then you just do yeah. the nilpotent Higgs. Yeah. 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 You're saying this four prime squared is just a theater. In fact, I think you're right, because this is six, five, one, four, two, three squared, right. yeah. And four, one squared, yeah, yeah, maybe. And this, yes. this, I think, makes complete sense that you leave the prime stuff be yeah, and yeah, yeah. Just work with the unprimed and okay. it will be great. Because primes, roughly speaking, for those of you who know, you know, that have read this paper by uh, Marcus Santiago Nami, have to do with the fact that you have a stack. Sometimes you can have a stack in S5, half in S5 on the O8 minus, but, you know, this, disregard that and start playing again the game with the D8s. And then that's why you can construct, uh, as you say, the Hasse uh, of, say, SL6 in this case. Yeah. Thanks for the observation. You're right. I have one more question on this. So when you say that you find these sub diagrams, these are not actually sub diagrams of the diagram in which, in, in, no. which I mean that the, the connections are not. I'm using, exactly. Diagram. You may have to skip precisely. I'm using yeah. sub diagram uh, in a very loose sense. Correct. So it's it's uh, it's in the same way that you would say in the diagram for nilpotent orbits of SLN, you can find all the others SL. Exactly. Lower. It's just a, you're they're absolutely, not sub diagrams. They are. You they're can absolutely see. correct. The point is that we have a nice interpretation from the physics of brains. That's why we focus on this. Because then you could ask, ah, this is uh, KQ14. Why can I not find, say, the Hasse of SU12 or something like that? And mm -hmm. the point is that you don't have enough D8s to play this game. That's why, at most, you will always find this. We have explained explicitly in the paper the Hasse of SU9, depending on the parity of K, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why we wanted to focus on this and, you know, lose the speaking, call it a sub diagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you can, you can only have blocks of size six, right? You can only have blocks of size six. Uh, yeah, the partitions cannot be, you cannot have more than exactly, six. Exactly, correct, six. because you're not, you're not allowed to touch the prime. Yeah. yeah, precisely. How am I doing with time, Julius? I mean, um, we're we're at the hour, but um, I'm right happy the hour to already. Some more, uh, <laughs> some more uh, well, How much more time do you want? Um, I don't know. Like, I can skip some parts. I can go. I can go quickly okay. through one part, and then we can maybe focus on the conjecture. Or I'm, I'm sure you guys will have many, many questions. Yeah, exactly. It, it's good. Just keep okay. going. Okay. All right, so let me go very quickly here. Uh, basically, what we did with, with what we're doing now with Simone and Subendu is generalize again the. Uh, okay, this was Marcus. We generalize once again the this picture, and something else you can do is construct the so-called massive string theories. These are another class, yet another class of one comma zero ICFTs that don't have a realization in type two A, but they do in F theory or again massive type two A. Essentially, the total Roman's mass of the gate, of the system is not zero, so you're not allowed to lift it back to M theory. However, you do have a description in F theory, and this will be this thing. And again, you can play the same game, and what we're finding here is that we can construct two different kind, kinds of, of flows. One which is very similar to the one that I just described for Orbin Santos, and then another flow which is slightly different. It is, looks more similar to a T brain bath, but now for the right uh, factor. But you know, due to lack of time, let me skip that. Okay, so Back to the point that Craig was asking about. So, so far, I've only described flows at fixed n, right? I've decided to fix n throughout my talk and the paper. However, we do know that you can change n by performing a so-called small instance of transition that transforms the tensor into, say, 29 hypers. And this is exactly the perspective that was implicitly assumed in these two papers by Tom, Frey, uh, Simone, Raphael, and, and Moletti, okay? There they have examples of flows, but N is allowed to change. And the meaning of the green labels here is precisely that of identifying, you know, all CATS labels from which you can transition now to the same Hasse diagram, but with N change into N minus one, okay? So what we do is you now take the magnetic queries for these nodes, you then take the magnetic queries for, again, the same cuts labels, but with n changed, I mean, swap with n minus one, you compute the subtractions and realize that you can only flow 
to the Hasse of at n minus one, not from all uh, points, but rather only from the green points. Okay, so that's the meaning of the green uh, decoration in the flows. Sorry, in the hierarchies that you will see in the table. So let me conclude and then get back to the um, to the conjecture. So by subtracting no possible consistent consistent ways that really magnetic quivers associated with the 60 or being symptoms, we have constructed all Higgs brain charge flows at X N and K compatibly with the theorem. The hierarchy of flows is the Hasse diagram of polymorphisms, or we'd like to propose that it is the Hasse diagram of E bedding sub ZK inside uh, E8. And as you can, as you've seen, as I hope you, uh, you, you know, you were you was able you were able to to see from the pictures, only big A, little A, little D, and little E, craft uh, purchase transitions appear in these Hasses. Okay. Then, as I showed, uh, the Hasse diagrams contain the uh, Hasse of orbits of SU up to nine. They may also contain, even though I've not uh, explained this. Um, they may also contain a partial Hasse diagram of orbits of SO16, and also we've seen this parallel flows structure of SCFTs that differ by, by theta angle. We're extending this work to, as I said very briefly toward the end, to massive string theories with Simone and Suvendu. Another thing that I haven't mentioned here, and this is a completely different direction that we're um, exploring with Suvendu and Bruno De Luca, is that of studying the stability of the holographic uh, duals the non susi uh, version of those uh, vacua in presence of the OA, extending analysis by Fabio, uh, Alessandro, Brun, I think Alessandro Agnacchi also, and, uh, and Gabriele. And this could also be relevant for studying the issue of scale separation in ADS string vacua with orientables. Okay, this is a completely different uh, you know, avenue of, of research. So let me get to the conjecture. You can see Paul is raising his brows. Okay, this is <laughs> hopefully in collaboration with Paul and Subendu. They were not, you know, gonna leave me alone in this. But again, let me stress once more that the Hasse of homomorphisms only contain big A, little a, little d, little e, kp transitions or degeneration of singularities in the more mathematical uh, parallels. And this, as was pointed out, pointed out to us by Paul, is exactly the types of minimal degenerations of the so-called E8 orbits in the affine Grassmannian of E8. And this is a theorem by these three uh, gentlemen here. Uh, I'm not gonna define what a Grassmannian is. Uh, if you're interested, there is a very nice paper by Antoine Julius, Sami, Marcus, and, and Jean Gao that essentially explains what this object is and its relation for moduli spaces of 3D n equals four uh, quivers essentially from brain setups. So it's very interesting the work kind of seen a very similar structure to what these people have seen uh, in mathematics. So a natural conjecture, of course, could be that the affine Grassmannian of E8 is the underlying geometric structure of the Higgs branch of the modular space of our instantons. Said differently, it may be uh, capable of describing N E8 instantons on uh, an ALE space, say C2 mod ZK, for which there is no, at least as far as I know, ADHM construction. I know that Nopadol has, has a single author paper from some years ago trying to attack the same problem from uh, you know, similar techniques. But I think at this point in time, but again, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not an expert, what the modular space of any eight instantons on this similar space is not known, okay? So perhaps the structure of uh, hierarchy of flows that we're seeing, yes? I think that the, the Coulomb branch construction is, is worked out. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we can check. Maybe it's not for all of them, but I was under the impression that uh, this is the paper by Nopadol. Yeah, I, I thought that the NE8 instantons on C2 mod ZK was worked out. So basically, you get a thinking diagram which looks like E8 and a fine E8, and then you put, yeah, that's, them, okay. you put I, flavors I, on top. I think we're going to discuss that. We can I, discuss later. Okay, okay. I mean, okay, let me then slightly rephrase it by saying that maybe this is another way of presenting that. I don't know. Uh, maybe this has to do with the modular space of any E18 sometimes on this singularity. I don't know. It's just that it, you know this is a powerful uh, observation. The fact that in this hierarchy of flows for orbit sometimes we only get uh, those transitions that are also included in the uh, if you want degenerations in the partial order of the degenerations of the orbits of the fine Grassmannian of the eight. 
And if you're not um, you know, happy with this, let me get to an even more powerful conjecture. So consider the case k equal four, and this is what we would obtain. This is what we obtained with Subendu. So at fixed n, so something maybe you don't like, what we have found is that we have this Hassel, very simple looking Hassel homomorphism, where only big A, little a, and little d appear, okay? But now you go back to the paper by uh, Tom and Frey, and you see that also little e is allowed. And why is that the case? Well, because you're allowing n to change, therefore you're performing small instant on transitions. And given k is fixed here, k equal, equals four say, there should be an object that if it, you know, if it's sliced in some way, so as to fix n, where produces the Hasse that Subendo and I constructed on the left. But if you slice it in some other way, there, namely, you know, in, in physics terms, allowing n, so the number of m5s to change, it should reproduce the hierarchy that Tom and, and Frey uh, obtained, which are represent here on the right. And it seems to us that the most natural object that could reproduce the structure, and as I speak, we're checking this essentially for the first few cases, could be something called double affine Grassmannian that has not been fully constructed, it's my understanding, in mathematics, even though there have been attempts. And the first paper is this one that I think, uh, you know, Ami, Julius, Antoine, Jean Gau, Marcus, I was also aware of by Breverman and Finkelberg. So this double affine Grassmannian, I'm not going to go into the definition, uh, but it seems. Um, it has to do with the affine Yates linking essentially. And it, it seems to us, in fact, it passes the first, you know, checks for k equal three and I think k equal four. If you slice it in some way, you indeed obtain the Hass on the left. If you slice it in some other way, essentially by allowing, a, oh, sorry, a parameter that is associated with what we would call number of M5 brains, you would have the hierarchy uh, on the right. And with this double conjecture, I end. Thank you very much. All right, let's take Marco. Questions? So I, I was just checking. I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure that uh, yeah, you see, um, it's explicitly done. Maybe, maybe I'm... I mean, what I think what he does is that he proposes another quiver who's... Now I don't remember what... Coulomb branch, branch, branch. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is because there's no ADHM construction even... Precisely. Exactly. In I mean, so you have to come up with some other thing, exactly. That was but, my so that, so that, um, we could be very very nice if we could find another uh, mathematical object essentially, which is capable of giving us. And now, of course, here I'm speaking about e. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is a way of extending to other exceptional cases. I don't know. The the, the previous construction that you said is correct. Is fine. You, you could cover all cases. All cases. You, you okay. okay. What you just said. The... Okay. You take the affine eight and you just decorate it with flavors. Mm. So this the, is the question component. is what is the relation between the two? Huh? There, there is a, a precise map. You have a collection of sectors. Each flavor is giving you the particular breaking pattern. Right? So you have um, eight instant terms on uh, um, yeah, mod, mod, uh, mod ZN. Mm -hmm. Mod ZN. So it, there is a, you could map that to, you, you could also try to compute the, uh, so there are two data, two pieces. Um, there is the embedding inside SUN, mm -hmm. right? So, so at infinity, you have to specify the uh, bound conditions. And the second part is to specify the, um, second and third churn clusters of the solutions. And those are given by the gauge numbers. And uh, so the combination of two are, are uh, giving you the, the instant on solution, E8 instant ons on uh, ZN singular. And the, in, in this but, work uh, of- uh, yeah, Do we understand on. the geometry of that modular space? I mean, is that like the closure of some orbit? Yes. That's uh, it's a fine. Sorry. So I, I, I that, okay, Paul, Paul, that's my question. Says, yes, but I, I would like to understand what is if we can come up with some, uh, you know, with some geometric description of that uh, of that modular space. 
I understand it, it can be given as the Coulomb branch of the specific we were. This is geometric, right? I mean, the Coulomb branch in principle, you could work out equations. It's just extremely hard. Yeah, exactly. It's just, sorry, then, I meant in practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, in the equations, you will also not really be able to write down, I guess, for like in general. But it's so, always hard. But maybe you have uh, some other than understanding. But the paper so, of Robert Finkelberg. The the I now I, I look I just checked again. They literally say uh, double fine Martin via instantons on C2 mod ZK. And then yeah. this would be precisely those things. So basically all of the slices would be in a fine quiver with some flavor boxes. I this see. is the conjecture, I guess. I see. And then this is exactly what you find as a magnetic quiver in 60. So this seems very or or is the slices as varieties, so the orbits could be given by the Coulomb branch of a sum 3D quiver. That's what they're saying. Exactly. So basically, any slice, any slice would then be given by this. But it, this has to be checked, of course. But it, it, this is—it's very it's natural. Okay, so there's definitely a relationship. Between, you know, uh -huh. uh, so here's that. the thing. I think that's, so. These are the Uhlenbeck spaces, right? Is that is that what they're called in Braverman Finkelberg? So they have a construction of these slices. So what's not at all clear to me is is how you can get the analog of this Malkin Ostrich Vibornov rules that describes exactly what the singularities are. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's the gap. They have a construction of these things, um, which is quite abstract. And I'm a mathematician and I still can't really follow it. <laughs> and so, and then, you know, and then there's a fairly straightforward set of rules for the ordinary affine Grassmannian. So if you can just sort of replicate that, the obvious version of that for the double affine Grassmannian, it will give you the singularities that Marco has in all, all of these diagrams. But that's, for me, that's the, that's the essence of the conjecture. Why? Does that thing follow? Yeah. So the, the, are there, sorry, just are there um, questions uh, <laughs> for, for oh, Marco? Somebody else. What was in the talk before we just, you know, go? Uh, so, so, so I can ask something maybe more, uh, uh, well, in a different direction. So the Hasse diagrams that you draw for fixed N, they often have multiple starting points. Mm, good point. Yes. So, you're right. So, so I, I sort of have two questions. How does the number of starting points grow with N or K? Um, so as far as I can tell, if I remember correctly from my own paper, up to the point that we checked that we could actually compute them, so which is roughly K equals 22, mm -hmm. it doesn't. You have at most two, but again, Subendo can correct me on this. I don't honestly remember. Mm -hmm. I think it was at most two. And we don't fully, we don't, I don't think we understand why. Do you remember which and curve answers. configurations they are? Sorry? Do you remember like something about the curve configurations? I probably I actually just have them paper. fully written down, <laughs> so I can show them to you if you're interested. We okay. use Napa's algorithm to construct all of the theory configurations. Right, right. Uh, because I see. So you're wondering whether that's related to the effect that you discussed with uh, Jacques and Monica. Well, not not necessarily the top theories, but I'm curious because. Mm, well, if I think about the Hasse diagram where I allow myself to change n by doing small instanton transitions, I can always choose a unique top theory, which has E8 symmetry for any k. Yes. Um, and so, well, that, then I can say, well, I can forget about everything that comes from Higgsing. And if I want to, I can say every 60 SCFT via fission infusion comes from the theory with the E8, mm -hmm. if you like. Whereas if I want to, if I want to slice in this different way, I should say instead there is this collection of top theories, and everything else comes from Higgsing and fission infusion and so on. Um, it's so I'm just some, curious. I think somehow, yeah, you're yeah, right. No, that's a good question. I think somehow physically, it's it would be best not to fix n. I think that's what this uh, is pointing to. As you say, you should always start from the a theory, and then be able. To, and this is exactly what you're what we're also seeing from the double affine guy. You start yeah. from the A theory and you always flow to something else. So uh, the, I think that one starting point is always FU6 so with uh, R5 having the tri and oh, T symmetric. Interesting. Yes. Because, yeah, that one cannot be obtained as X thing of anything else. Mm. Okay, interesting. Even though I don't remember, I mean, even in the uh, uh, but k equal three perhaps is I don't remember whether you can. Okay, with k equal three, you don't have uh, any. I meant k equals six even. That, but you see, that's the point. You need to. 
consider some sufficiently high K, and I think it's K equals six, if I'm not mistaken, to start having cuts labels whose type 2A, or if you want to have your description feature on the minus one curve, not empty, but rather S to six with the three index anti-symmetric. And then as Simone is saying, uh, you cannot fix anything to get to that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe there's like multiple ways of presenting this. I, and maybe this, the fact that we only see two head or top green dots is just an artifact of the fact that we were insisting on fixing N basically mm -hmm. to make the pictures comprehensible. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, it's, it would, obviously it's a huge mess, right? If you allow N to change and you consider a high K, it's impossible to understand anything out yeah. of it. Yes. Um, right. So, so there's also, I mean, so, so this, this double F min, F in Grassmannian is supposed to capture the N changes as well, but there are two other changes you can do. You can also do nilpotent Higgsing on the right and exactly. you can do K changing Higgsings. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I'm guessing this is now some completely terrifying object that Precisely. contains the double F in Grassmannian. <laughs> In fact, this is not the full Higgs branch uh, of the modulate space of the orbiting sentence. Per se, I haven't said this, but you know, uh, you guys know, I have not even touched the right flavor algebra. Yeah. You could also do that. Then I don't know whether there's an even bigger, larger mathematical object that captures both, or maybe it's a union of two mathematical objects. I don't know. Wait, wait. It may not the, be the, very. You're going too fast. I think uh, those are all included in the uh, double of Grassmannian. No, I, no, no, I don't think so because mm -hmm. you just have a longer tail. Exactly. So the double of Grassmannian, and then there is also just other stuff Down related to the right. to the extended tail because the magnetic quiver is not just a fine dinking diagram. It's a fine dinking diagram, and then even more stuff. I see. Yeah, that's so all exactly. basically the, some some part of the Hasse diagram will be a slice in the double of Grassmannian. But then there will be other stuff. So basically, you mean in the less. even larger one, if you were to consider it's even larger, and it may not be a natural space. mathematical space to look at. Like that, that's a question, of course, whether this is an object that would be useful for representation. Yeah, I have no idea. A simpler version of this is the just the n n n n n quiver, which stops with two flavors of n, and we mm -hmm. we have it's it's a similar thing. It would be a bit simpler because now it's finite on both sides. And we know that at the bottom we have the product of the two nilpotent. Uh, so you mean like a n comma a n collision? A n to a n conformal matter. That's a simpler version of this, and already this is not okay. indeed double affine. And but it is it is uh, it has at the bottom a, a product structure, but then some more complicated stuff. I see. So once you Higgs every bottom, you mean like Higgs in mostly on say one of the two sides? You can Higgs on the two sides independently until, uh, until start. there is a limit. So well, if the quiver is too short, then you exactly. will think which so, collapse. Correct. And if it's long enough, then you can do it for a while. And then there is the part where you start removing the middle thing. Yeah. So in that sense, it's it's a product of the two nil cones plus some additional thing. And that's all of this in one space. And then what you have here is, is the same thing, but much more complicated because now one side is this, but the other side is the, uh, is the double affine. Yeah. So good question. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. So, so the, 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 probably the double affine Grassmannian is the, the thing which uh, is interesting for mathematicians. And Precisely, then, yeah. I and think then this thing that appears in you know, an F theory is just a whole lot more complicated. Precisely. So I think the punchline of this is we have some construction in physics that somehow is pointing to the direction that the, you know, double of fine respondent has this specific foliation structure. And I think that is interesting for mathematicians as well. So typically has it diagrams, like we, we well, let's say, you know, I like uh, <laughs> things, but I also, this includes other people, but maybe not everyone. Uh, it's really nice when the has it diagram is for example, a line or something like this, when there, there are not too many bifurcations, because then you can say, this is the has it diagram, for the whole Higgs branch, for you know, in some family, yeah, or you know, whatever, and then and then this is super neat. And sure. when you get the, when you get bifurcations, it becomes complicated to describe. And basically, you have no chance. Exactly. So, <laughs> and then, so then the the what's really nice about the affine Grassmannian, for example, is that uh, even if you get a very high complexity Hasse diagram, you can still say, but the the the, the structure is clear. It's just co weights of a group. And uh, we know co-weights, and of course, if you go to a high rank, it's gonna look complicated, but it's understood. 
And yeah. um, th this is why I think it's nice to basically recast into a language, for example, of double Fangrasmanian, because otherwise, without this structure of a root system or something like this, there is just no chance. It's just a, it's just a pure mess. So we we do need something like this. It basically becomes too hard now to draw. Like uh, you know, if we do k equals to hundred, no chance. You know, for SUK with uh, higher flavors, we can do K equals to 100. We can draw the diagram. It's very easy. Yeah, of course, this, of course. No chance. Because so, the theory is simpler enough. I mean, <clears throat> exactly, exactly. So, so then that's that's why I think it's really important to figure out this double fingers money to then we understand a whole lot more in the. I agree. I agree. Sixty okay. thing, and also just about instantons. I mean, the the, the model space instanton instanton yeah, that, that relation as well. Right. It's really interesting. Yeah. Are we in the discussion session or still in the question? Oh, I, I think we're still recording. <laughs> okay, maybe we should thank Marco. Are there more questions uh, for Marco? But, uh... Yeah, yeah let's, ask, let's ask a question. I, I have a question, actually, um, which is completely orthogonal. Uh, so you mentioned these ABJ anomalous U1s in 60. Uh, and um, there was the work this year about, you know, the, the ABJ anomaly in... in um, Maxwell or in QED actually, and yes. there you have this uh, non-invertible symmetry. So yes, let's not, that's, non let's not talk about that. Okay, yeah, fine, fine. That's kind of his scope test antennas. Now, of course, you can play the same game. Obviously, that's like uh, you're asking whether you can play the same game for U60 yep. ABJ. I believe so. Okay, okay. Uh, I mean, I'm not the expert here, but I believe you can probably recast their analysis. Maybe if Fabio has. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean. Uh, Recycle, sorry, more than recast their analysis. Recycle that analysis for 60 uh, ABJ analysis. And then you can say something interesting about the 60 pi on. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, this, Naturally. This looks yeah, yeah. like you know machine to generate papers, but maybe, maybe it's interesting <laughs> to actually say something about this uh, ABJ anomaly was, perhaps, yeah. But these are not U1 theories, though. They are all non-abelian cage theories. Sure, sure. So, but um, so, so uh -huh. Okay. No, no, there is, there is I think, uh, some non-invertible symmetries. Mm -hmm. It's a bit different from QED. It will, be, it will be more involved to do than in 4D with a U1. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Way okay. more involved, I would say. I mean, even looking at what they do for Maxwell. <clears throat> Are we, oh, I see. OK, do we have more questions? Oh, now it's an intimate club, but you haven't realized that. <laughs> All right. So I'd say uh, let's thank Marco again. Sure. Should I and stop I'll sharing? Stop the recording. <laughs>